Well, greetings from Los Angeles to wherever you guys are. I want to thank you for joining me for this about the next hour. And uh, I'm looking forward to sort of share some information with all you guys. And, and I hope that you will get something out of this and it will be somewhat enjoyable after the end of a long day. Uh, before we get to the program, I just want to make sure that I make it clear that none of the photos have been altered in any way, perhaps enhanced, but not manipulated in any way. And that uh, uh, for some reason, this is not advancing. And uh, that in general, I work with many companies as far as testing different things, etc. But uh, there is no specific payroll or anything that I'm on, and, and there's no products that I have an interest in. Tonight's lecture is in part sponsored by GC America, who is a big part of literally everything I do at the office. And I've used their products for many, many years. And, and plan to continue to do so. Um, a note about my experience with Panky. I have had the chance to be there and I think you guys have an amazing group and the efforts that you put in to create your programs is nothing short of outstanding. And I just love the moment we get on your website, the statement that you have, which is so true. So, as I said, I'm coming to you from Los Angeles, and uh, believe it or not, it's almost 100 degrees where I am, and my topic today is interdisciplinary dentistry, which in a big way I attribute to how I have managed to have a successful practice that I've enjoyed for almost 30 years. I want to begin with a case that you'll notice the date on. It is 2003, and this young lady comes to me because she's unhappy with her smile and, and she feels that she's missing two anterior teeth. Therefore, she thought that implants is the answer and, and, and she wanted to fix her smile that way. And in sort of assessing the case, and this is her second fixed partial denture that she's had, we kind of notice that the lip support is lacking and the lower teeth are maybe coming a little more forward. And, and oftentimes when, when we sort of think just for the moment and we don't think of the big picture, we forget a little obstacle or something. And, and obviously the previous dentist with all the best intentions never really discussed with her the possibility of maybe bringing these teeth back. So we, thought interdisciplinary versus multidisciplinary, and how I'd like to define that is interdisciplinary is when all the team members before they begin collaborate and formulate a plan versus multidisciplinary where everybody kind of gets the patient on their own terms and does something for the patient. And, and, and a really neat sort of description of this, and, and I'll sort of digress on a personal note here. I used to run this international restorative symposium for, for USC, and the second or third year that we were doing this in 2009, our topic was exactly this, interdisciplinary dentistry. And my close friend, Nardine Abishai Sadan, usually would write an address for this. And this sentence of his basically defines for me the ideal way to do dentistry and forever because as it says the end of everything is what we really should think about our techniques and technologies may change frequently but how we look at things should not so back to this case then you know we sort of did our analysis and we went and we decided that one of her teeth needs to be removed so that we can retract the lower anteriors the issue there was a lack of ridge support and the adjacent teeth were already prepared. So really, there was not a huge advantage in this case to do any sort of an implant work. And we were able to accomplish what she kind of wanted, but just not the way that she thought she was going to get it. So how I like it to sort of think about interdisciplinary dentistry is that you communicate, you collaborate, and you create, and then you've been interdisciplinary. So 
you see this case, and this is a 10 year follow up. And, and you notice that the tissue, because it's a really good solid tissue is remaining. And I think the case is progressing rather well. And here is my failure where I didn't collaborate and the patient sort of needed an implant and we didn't think of any of these things. And by the time that I'm ready, nothing is really in the right place and we have trouble. So why should we try to be interdisciplinary? Well, simple, because we can practice what we enjoy. For example, I don't do any endodontic therapy. I refer all periodontal surgery. And I find people who frankly are better than me at doing those things and they do it all day. And it allows me to collaborate with them. So I've learned a great deal from this interdisciplinary process. And many times now I have people that refer to me that are the specialists because they've gotten comfortable in the process that we follow. So it's just been a great way to get there. And the, the definition of our practice today is that we are a minimally invasive restorative office, which I don't really even know what that means, but when people want to send other patients to our office, that's kind of how they define it. And uh, my role or your role in this process essentially is to be the restorative dentist, which means you sit between the specialist, the patient and the dental technician. Very important to think of the dental technician in this process, because oftentimes they're not consulted in the beginning. So that becomes my tool chest, periodontal help, technology, oral surgery, prosthodontics, endodontics. And I just wanna give great homage and credit to these gentlemen that you see up on the screen that have really helped me for many, many years in the, in the years that I've practiced, which is coming close to 29 years in, in Southern California in the same office. Now, none of what I'm showing you today would be possible without the expertise of these dental technicians. And they come with different sets of knowledge and skill and, and, and you know, without them again, there is no way that we could get to where we are. And, and my job is really simple when I have that dream team that helps me. My job is to basically treatment plan in a very systematic way. That's what I want to talk to you guys a little bit about. I learned from Frank Spear a long time ago, sometime I think in the 1999, I took all the Seattle courses at the time and, and this statement has always stayed with me, whereas treatment planning is a linear process. It has a beginning and it has an end and ultimately how we get there can be in different ways, but the process of looking will remain the same. So let's take a case as an example. For example, if I were to think, how do we think about this? Do we think about the aesthetics? Do we think about function? Do we think biology? What should come first? And this little example may, may sort of help a little bit in figuring this process out. And um, this is Lori, and she'd been a patient in our office for some time. And one day on the weekend, and just to date myself and, and let you guys know, this was in the times that we used to have pagers, I get a page and she's having an emergency. And her emergency, and this is a conversation on the phone that we're having, is basically she's broken a tooth and, and she's going on a trip and she's very concerned. And you know, I'm thinking, okay, she's not in pain, but she could be in pain any minute. I basically call an endodontist and tell them that this is what I might have to do, get an assistant to come in and see her. And of course, this is what the fuss is about. Now, maybe to you and I as dentists, this is just a nothing because we just deal with this all the time. And compared to what we see, this is a very minor problem. But consider the other alternative. This is a lady who's always taking good care of herself and she's never broken a tooth and she hears that loud sound and something feels like a gigantic hole and it's razor sharp. So when we go in to see her and we sort of start looking, essentially there's the broken tooth, here's the radiograph, and you can basically see that she has a crown on the adjacent tooth right around here, and maybe it's not the best crown. She's got a very well done root canal treated tooth, and, and really when she smiles, this is her smile line. 
And the question here should be, what should I focus on from a treatment planning perspective? Do I just handle the broken tooth? Do I talk about the crown? Do I look at this with aesthetics in mind, function, structure, biology? How do we actually go and, and put this piece together? And what I'd like you to consider is if you consider aesthetics as the first thing, which oftentimes doesn't sound logical, it helps you formulate a plan a little bit better. I'll sort of give you an example. If you saw Lori and you just did that, say, filling and maybe changed the crown and six months later she decided, oh, you know, I want to whiten my teeth, then where are you? Do you redo the crown? Do you tell her she can't have whitening? But if you've had the conversation, then it's a little easier to make decisions. So let's go ahead and define this. And, and the first part of this definition to me is when we say aesthetics, what do we look at? It doesn't need to be that complicated. You come from the outside in and I basically look at the face. I look at the occlusal plane. I look at the midline. I look at the cant and I sort of make a mental note. Is this something that I need to consider or is it okay the way that it is? Then when we get a little bit closer, I look at the position of the maxillary teeth, buccal cusp of the posteriors, incisal edges of the anteriors, and I get a lot closer and I look at shape and texture. And essentially, if anything is not fitting what I think should ideally be there, it becomes a point of conversation. Once I've done that, then I think about the function. Is the patient comfortable? Does the joint hurt? Are they able to chew well? Is speech a problem? And in my investigation, if I find something, obviously it's something that needs to be discussed. Then comes individual teeth. Are they all sound? Do they need any support before we take on bigger treatment plans? Are they aesthetically fitting where they are? And is there diseases of the teeth in this component structurally? And then ultimately, are there infections? Is there inflammation? And is the patient systemically okay? Now, please consider that I am not saying this is the way that you would begin and treat. This is the way that you treat and plan with the end in mind. The sequence of treatment obviously will change dramatically and you start the opposite direction. In Lori's case, we start with the broken tooth, what the patient wants. How do we keep them to stay healthy so that we can actually treat each individual teeth and make them work in function and in harmony and become beautiful? And it all, like most things, can work rather well if you follow a checklist. I don't know if many of you guys know who Atuel Guande is, but Atuel has written a book which is called The Checklist Manifesto. And if you look at all the industries that he looked at, the ones that usually do very well are the ones that follow a systematic process. And what I'm proposing to you is just for your own benefit, do this systematic approach and have this discussion with your patients. Now, once we know what we want to do, and this is where I feel a lot of dentists who intend to do more comprehensive work fail, and this is where I know Panky spends a lot of time trying to bring knowledge of the process to its participants, is how do you make your patient understand what you know and what you can do for them? And it just cannot happen by you seeing them for an exam and just giving a treatment plan and expecting your office coordinator to just go and do this. Now, let's digress a little. Now we're talking psychology. This is not really anything with our knowledge as a dentist, but our ability to communicate. And we all have certain hurdles in there. And what I want to give you is some information about our colleagues who are plastic surgeons. When you look at what plastic surgeons do, and when you look at the number of things that they do and the procedures that they sort of do, their primary clientele are female and their male clients are less, and that number is increasing. And I would say that when I look at more aesthetic stuff, my percentages are not that skewed, but are somewhat similar. And we just have to accept that, that people think differently. And I don't mean to be sexist. This is not because of that reason that I have that slide up, but men of which I am one, 
we often don't think so many things. We make a decision and then we go with it and that's how life goes for us. Women, on the other hand, are a lot more cerebral. They think a lot about, about the things and, and why I'm sort of putting this out here for you is if you take on the front end and address all the concerns and highlights all the benefits and the treatment goes as you predicted, you are a hero. God help you if you just brush something off and don't address it and a complication or an expectation is not met. And, and with that, what needs to happen is that the patient, man or woman, needs to be in control. They need to feel that they're doing something that's good for them because let's face it, this type of dentistry could be life-changing, but it's not a necessity. And also, if it improves their looks, then it's a benefit, right? So then really, we're looking at discretionary things that we offer. And our competition, unlike what many of us think, is not the dentist next door. It is the other kinds of things that people spend their time and money to enjoy themselves, to feel better, and, and to just have a better life. So the concept of comprehensive dentistry which I know is, again, very dear to the Panky philosophy, comes with being able to communicate this. And many times people are, are sort of thinking, my patients are never going to do this because insurance doesn't cover this. And for that, again, I will go to this concept of look at the plastic surgeons. And when you look at how many procedures these people actually do, it's in the tune of $16 billion a year. How much of that do you think is covered by insurance? None. If you take that even further and you sort of go to more invasive procedures, similarly, you'll see that there's a lot of people that have an interest in doing things that makes them feel better. So it's the perceived value that we create. Now, going back to Lori here, before she broke the tooth, when she became a patient, I took the time and I understood her needs and I allowed myself to communicate that with her at a time that really she didn't have to make any decisions. Part of my process is I would like to sort of see patients' photos from before. Now, many people my age will not really have a lot of photos, but anybody growing up today can probably provide you a photo per hour. And what you see is like her wedding photo. And usually when people say, I don't have a photo, I'm like, are you married? Go look in your files. And then when there is a will, there's a way and they find it. And I don't know how you're going to take this. It, 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 in some ways, it's sad, but 30% of all pictures taken today in our youth is of themselves. The upside for us is we know what the teeth used to look like before. So when I take Lori, and in her mouth, she can see the changes, that becomes a powerful motivation for her to see if I can improve it for her. So then after I have my information, I basically go through and do a keynote, not much different than this, where I present the different things that I notice in her. And I, I sort of like, sit with her without any pressure and, and really I educate her. And the relevant factors for her in this situation where that you have a couple of restorations that are doing well, you have a crown that could be better and slide by slide I've kind of showed her what we're doing and now there's a lot of different ways that you could do this, but a simple sketch and a photo from them from before would actually make the case. And, and I was basically, I'm showing her if we were to go ahead and change this for her, this is more or less what that would look like. And then after that's done, I basically give a list of diagnosis. And remember, diagnosis is universal. It's irrespective of what the patient wants and irrespective of what you're proposing for them. But treatment plans are highly individual. So I feel everyone deserves to know what's possible. And how I start that process is by telling them in 2020, if you wanted to have everything that we could offer you, we could go and go through the list. In her case, there's these five things. And then the alternative plan, which always needs to be there so the patient feels safe and so that we are honest and, and ethical about letting somebody know what are the things that if they didn't do something bad would happen and they should understand whether it's urgent or not.
And then I basically leave it alone and the patient decides what they want done. So in this particular case, eight months before she actually broke the tooth, she had decided that she wants to whiten her teeth and she had decided that what she really wants to do is really restore the front six teeth because she's not happy that she's worn it down. And obviously that crown needed to change. So then my job is a lot easier in 2008 when I'm sort of sitting with her in this emergency and I can easily sort of like put it to her like, okay, so the, the best way is let me handle the broken part. And in order for me to get there, the crown needs to be redone anyway. So why don't I take the crown off? And that gives me proximal access so that I can fill that tooth for you. And at the same time, prepare the endodontically treated tooth. I then make her a provisional. And now she understands that she wants to go ahead and actually whiten all of her teeth. So she does that. And these bisacrylic provisionals, which are very commonly used, were relatively new at the time. And, and we basically did that. She went and she whitened her teeth and she went on her trip. And when she came back, we already had the coping to be tried. I just didn't have a shade to take. So she comes in, I put the coping, I verify the fit, I take a double impression or a pickup impression from it. And this is the case completed after it's all done something that would have probably been just maybe a crown and a distal occlusal composite had I not taken the time to really educate her of what's possible, had I not asked her to bring the photos, et cetera, so that she can understand what is lost and what can be gained. And now you see her about a year later, and when you do dentistry, adhesive dentistry well, you will be very predictable. And when things happen, repairs are pretty simple. So what I really am proposing, uh, I'm so sorry, let's just cancel and restart. What I'm really proposing is stick to that checklist and follow that protocol and always look at these steps and formulate your treatment plan, you will always formulate a good treatment plan. The only thing that I do not have the knowledge and I believe needs to be added to this list is not as dentist. It is kind of our responsibility to also include airway. And if there is anything we can do for people that have that kind of a problem. So now with that in mind, I would like to just go through one case and, and show you all the steps and then open this up for questions. And this case is a case that is an interdisciplinary case. And this is a person that sort of was a patient of mine when she was much younger, got married, kind of went to a different office. And then when she was proposed a really extensive treatment plan, she came back for a second opinion. And when I met her for the second time, I sort of proposed my process, which is you should let me take some information before I can tell you my opinion. That information is some photographs that you're going to see here, some time for me to analyze everything that's there. And then essentially about an hour at the end of the day for me to sit with her and go over this keynote very similar to the way you're seeing it. So basically, I've taken the photos and I'm going to sit with, sit with her, put these pictures on the screen. I'm going to talk about things that are great. I highlight like her vertical thirds are perfect and, you know, the lip positions is great. And then as we kind of get closer, I talk about the midline. I talk about the occlusal plane and whatever needs correction. Then we're having the discussion, how much teeth is showing, what the mucogingival gingival harmony would be here what the lip support is. And that part to me is the facial analysis. Then comes a little closer, which is the smile analysis. And over here, I'm looking at the incisal display at rest. I'm looking at maximum tooth showing, harmony with the lower lip. I'm basically looking to see if things work. And if someone asks me about my opinion of what the shade should be. I try never to go brighter than the eyes. And every time that we can, if we whiten prior to restorative dentistry, we just have a better outcome. And then ultimately we look at tooth form and the texture. And clearly there are some issues that can improve here. That's what she's interested in. 
She does not really have a lot of jaw issues, but that's something that we evaluate. And in this particular case, we, we did the joint analysis because we were considering an orthodontist. And, you know, she doesn't really have problems chewing, but she's very aware that she's been flattening her teeth for a long time. And uh, the overbite and the overjet is the key to successful anterior dentistry. So that's something that we want to pay a lot of attention to and really figure any problems that have to do with the occlusion or her temporomandibular joints. Once we clear that out, we get into our arch analysis and tooth position. Is there crowding? Are there fractured teeth? Is there anything that's a big vulnerability? And, you know, we kind of look at stuff like this and we think of that maybe a bad thing but this is a restoration that's been there over 10 years and when you see all these cracks and the tooth is surviving to me that's ideal biomimetic dentistry which is beyond our hour um, but but something that i highly believe in we look at areas of defects areas of of like broken restorations anything that is a concern we sort of bring out and then we continue this process by looking at anything biologically, any decay infections, inflammation, bone loss, et cetera. And then we systematically come up with our diagnosis and we make sure that there's no medical or psychological issues before we begin. So the checklist then becomes in a short period of time, we looked at all of these parameters and we made our notes and we had a discussion and we co-diagnosed what is a problem for that patient. Once that's done, the next step becomes, what do you do about it? In this case, it was decided that the teeth are worn. She doesn't show enough anterior tooth when she smiles smiles. She's not happy about the shade of her teeth and the texture of the teeth are basically gone and there's some drifting in the lower teeth. Functionally speaking, she's aware of the parafunction that's been going on for a very long time and essentially she sometimes has had some jaw discomfort but not often and one of the things that she points out is when she speaks saliva escapes out from some of her teeth. From there, we go structurally, multiple restorations are in need of sort of refurbishing. And when I met her, she was already in two provisionals on the lower left side and an anterior tooth was chipped. Biologically, some areas of root caries and generally a little bit of bone loss, but fairly sound. So then in the process of being interdisciplinary, what I really wanna decide is, which teeth are we going to restore? And when I basically look at that slide, I am looking to see what am I trying to change? And the moment that shade becomes a factor, things have to match. So even if this is a perfect restoration, if that's not the outcome she likes, we really are looking at the upper teeth at the minimum. We got to decide what specialties do we need and in this particular area i'm very adamant about being very conservative so wherever i can do anything that i can preserve the tooth i would like to and orthodontics becomes a huge asset when we think that way so if i look at this sort of inclination of the teeth and etc and i look at her occlusion I could definitely use a little help by bringing the lower anteriors back a little bit. Moving forward, we also look at the teeth from a mucogingival perspective. Obviously, we can have a lot of unsupported enamel nowadays with really good bonding processes, but the better we control that, the better. So if these become the ideal forms of the teeth, what would be nice is if I could extrude that tooth a little, show a little more display. And now what you're seeing is the same slideshow that, that I do for most people that kind of let me do this, where I am giving them examples of other similar cases, who the different technicians are, et cetera, and offering them options. In this case, my option number one, what I think would be the best option, in, involved some orthodontics and a lot of restorative work. And that would have looked something like this, where we basically restore many of the upper teeth, and, and less of the lower teeth because we would move the teeth away rather than prep. 
The other way would be to gain a restorative space by opening her vertical dimension, which would involve more teeth to be restored. And then ultimately, she has the choice of just doing the base minimum, which I know is not why she was in my office, but she should know that if she doesn't do anything elsewhere, she's not in a lot of trouble. That just happens to be something that, that is in need sometime soon. And then no treatment and what the consequence of that would be. At this stage, let's say your patient makes a choice. And, and I want to make the point that I don't do this and expect the patient to give me an answer. I basically do this and I let it go. And many times there is no phone calls that we make to see what happened. Are they going to come back, et cetera. The way I look at it, if they're interested, they're going to come back for it. And if they haven't come back for it, we will see them on recall. And then we will sort of ask where they are with it. And I think this works a lot better than if we keep asking, and are you coming, are you scheduling, or before you go, I expect you to do this. Um, in the end of the day, you will be surprised with the people who, just like Lori, will be in a position that something happens, then they know they don't want to do things twice. That's when they're ready to jump on your plan for you. And uh, how you sort of make this really organized is you need an excellent treatment coordinator in the front office and the back office that work in unison. Without that team, there's no way that I could perform the types of treatment that I'm showing you. And this process begins, I educate the patient, I walk away, someone from my team then sort of asks any questions, answers all the questions. We go over the treatment that they've chosen, we make a small letter that we send them, which really is a copy and paste of a lot of the things that was in this keynote. The keynote gets to become a PDF, that way they can share it with their loved ones. And if anybody's gonna be involved in the decision process, by the way, I always invite them to bring a significant other, a friend. If they have to explain to somebody who's gonna have an impact on the decision they're gonna make, I would like that person to be privy to the information that I so difficultly collected and presented. So it's very common that, that they, they come as a husband and wife or a mother and daughter. Sometimes people bring their friends and when they don't, then they have a virtual way of having this. Once the consultation and the aesthetic design is done after the whitening, all the restorative work can begin so that the orthodontist can go. That means anywhere possible, I prefer not to make any permanent restorations on the occlusion, especially if Invisalign is in the picture. My experience with Invisalign is terrific for certain things and horrific for others when you get things in the right place and the posterior teeth just don't touch. So if there is any control that I can keep, I'd rather it be after ortho. And then after the ortho, if she decided to go that way, the process gets repeated new models, new photographs, we do our wax up preparation, etc. And I'd like to just kind of take you through this and, and show you the case. So in our biologic and structural analysis, we realized that, okay, if ortho is going to take some time, I cannot leave these root caries, I cannot leave these little broken pieces that is going to collect a lot of food, I sort of need to protect her. And we did the initial work and essentially in a very simple way, we replaced some of the cervical areas. And what we did is we completed what she was in a provisional for with the understanding that we may or may not have to do this over. Then she's handed to one of the best orthodontists I know, a guy by the name of Dan Grauer, who has taught me so much about how teeth move and what customized ortho is all about. And in this case, he does his own analysis. He knows what I'm looking for. He's looked at this presentation, which is virtually available to him. And many times, actually, the orthodontist and the periodontist or whoever it may be, they meet. So we do this together with the patient. That becomes a very powerful appointment for everybody. And this is Dan's photos. And orthodontists are just so methodical in taking everything a particular way. So he takes his models, he does his scan, and he sends it to the center to design what these customized brackets are. Now, the difference here and what normal orthodontics does for you is in this case, 
each bracket is milled specifically for the tooth movement, which will be delivered via a jig that places it in a very specific location and a wire that is computer bent to the specific amount of torque that's needed to bring only the teeth that you want to make move. And it has been our experience that orthodontic work becomes much more efficient and takes long, a lot less time. Now, in the past, before we did it this way, essentially an orthodontist would put the brackets the best way they would know how. They would take these wires that would typically come in about three different sizes. They would align the arches. And then depending on the scale of the orthodontist, they would bend the wire and put force and bring the teeth in the location that they would want it to be. And sometimes if that's not so precise, something will open up and this back and forth would go for a long time. My experience with customized ortho is we still can tweak a little, but we hardly ever need to. And this becomes our goal. So in this process, this sort of square wire is built to fit these brackets. And our goal becomes to take a patient that is in this position and bring it so that we get a little more horizontal space. That's what that change would look like. And if you look at it in her actual dentition, this is what that would be like. And if I take the upper arch now and tell you what our goal would be is to bring it in a little. That allows me to have room for my ceramic without having to prep more. And the same thing is true on the lower arch. And that becomes the change. And this process is known from the beginning because the computerized orthodontics will tell the orthodontist this is going to take a series of, say, nine wires, and they will change the wires every month, or I don't know what the protocol is. And in this case, Dan would see the patient, and the original set would go, and then they would sort of keep progressing. And you would start seeing, like, where, for example, we wanted to bring this tooth down. There's a bend in the wire in exactly the amount that we would want it to be. And we go to wire number three and wire number four and whatever we have to do. And at some point, then the patient comes back to me when they're almost finished. And, and this would be about here. Now, if you look, we have brought this tooth down kind of like that graphic stimulation that we had done before. So this is where we are with things. And that would be the progression. And when they do these orthodontic brackets that are customized on the outside, we have some leeway. The same thing can be on the inside of the mouth, lingual braces where they don't show. We have less flexibility with making some tweaks. So now I have kind of forgotten about Jennifer for a while because she's been in ortho. And then all of a sudden she comes back to me and she's ready. Now, most people, if they see an orthodontist and they end up with a result like this, they're going to think that orthodontist is crazy. But here we're thinking with the end in mind. And the patient is very aware of this. And this is how we've sort of orchestrated it. So what, we're, what my job now becomes is put a few slides, go over this, explain to her like what goals we have achieved. And you can see how we have more tooth display. We've basically improved our spaces. So now the restorative dentistry can begin. At this stage, what I'm doing is I am essentially planning everything. And uh, in the planning process, the laboratory becomes a super important part. And this is just showing you the before and after. So this is where I put some of these slides of the before and after, and we have a discussion with the patients. At the end of this discussion, we are determining what teeth we need to do, what color we're going to have to do. And the decision becomes that because we did orthodontic therapy now, we maybe need to do less teeth, involve less teeth with restorations. Now, what the sequence becomes, originally we had all of this. Now we're at the stage of the final design. And I usually give them the choice of three different technicians that I'm comfortable with. And, and they choose a technician. And before I give this to have a wax up, what we really want to do is finish anything that's a direct restoration. So in this particular case, 
we basically have certain things that we are going to close spaces and some of the restoration that needs to be changed and a wax up gets done and i expect a lot from this wax up this wax up needs to be as precise as it can be and when you look from the inside and the occlusion and everything is kind of worked out very precisely and in the process of doing the wax up we did a little bit of festooning of the incisal edges and etc so the wax up can be done properly and i elected to bond those so that i have something to build against so in a very quick like a two hour two and a half hour appointment i basically am building these edges to where they should be where ultimately we would want them to possibly be veneers at least that was our thought process and this is the outcome that we get now what i'm doing is i'm testing the design i'm essentially doing a mock-up which is nothing but a press-on from the wax up that's an additive process and this happens to be one of the my favorite materials is the gc temp start because it's light curable and and it's like you know that the, the gun comes it's just a really pleasant material to work with and when i sort of do that mock-up and i get my bearing on that the wax up is already done my next job would be to take any indirect restoration and basically that's in the posterior and and prepare those so that i can have an occlusal scheme and then do a very calibrated reduction of the teeth for the purpose of what we're looking for i.e how much color change, how much space for ceramic, et cetera. And we don't have time to get through all that stuff now, but essentially in order to do this efficiently at the appointment time, if I haven't had the patient wear at home, they come, I etch the, the anterior teeth, I press my bisacrylic. Once the bisacrylic is prepped, I quickly make my guides. I've made these silicon matrices here that essentially let me know my reduction and you can see that the majority of what i have here is in enamel let's blow that up so all my margins are super gingival and it's as much as possible within enamel these would be the provisionals and essentially she will go home and when she is back for us to evaluate I always like to have them come back a day or two later to just see how things are looking. And my provisional fabrication process is I like to make them indirect. I basically take the, the, the prepped, take an impression, pour it up in a silicon putty. I have my matrix made already, which I've done for the mock-up. And I, I take my provisional material, I press it on, then I go ahead and I spot etch it and I can use the, the glazing material on the provisional. And now this is in her case, I think a couple of days later, she comes back, I'm checking speech, I'm checking position, I'm checking function. And in, in very specific ways, I wanna see what I need to modify. Look at what we're able to achieve by being interdisciplinary. If I did not have Dan's help, these teeth could not have this internal contour or they could at the expense of a lot of tooth reduction so as i'm evaluating all of this so that i don't want to redo much of that in the ceramic work if everything is okay then there's nothing to do if i monitor or change anything then i take an impression on some photographs and send it to the lab then naoki does his beautiful ceramic work and essentially he sends me these for a try-in and i want you to take a moment and really appreciate how much effort goes into making a very thin veneer at this high level I mean, you know, it takes a lot of talent and effort and time to do this. So then my job is to follow a very specific adhesive protocol so that I can go ahead and deliver these restorations. And my way, the only way that I'm super comfortable is to have excellent isolation, make sure I see my margins, deliver them one at a time, and use a heated composite and assure seating. And I basically do that on one tooth and, and, and then without having that retraction, there's no way that I can be sure that I'm seated very well. And I always have to make some small adjustments on contacts. So that is just something that it's painful, but I've just accepted that this is how we deliver veneers, but it works really, really well.
then you always want to deliver your thinnest bonded restoration, allow them to rehydrate before you give a shade for the posterior teeth so that they can be matched. And in this particular case, now you're sort of looking at this before and after. And we are done and we decided that really at this time, she doesn't really need to do anything with the lower teeth. One, I prefer for her not to have veneers because of the wear that can happen on the uppers. And I'm able to give her what she needs with the help of the orthodontist and some bonded dentistry. Now you will see that we are following the aesthetic principles. For her, it was important that everything looks natural. So we were able to create that with the ceramic work. And these next photos are Naoki's photos. Naoki Hayashi is one of the most brilliant technicians and ceramists that I've ever had the privilege to work with. And you are looking at these ceramics that are cemented with bonded composite. And uh, I, I think that every time that I do this, it's almost like a box, a gift is given to me that I get to install. They're just so beautifully put together. And then when you work with him, these are some of the things that you get at the end of the day. Now, it's not about how it looks on the day one, but how this works over time. And you can see year one, year two, year three. And I very recently saw her for a follow-up. And if I were to be super critical, I could tell you that the tissues are migrating a little, but nothing that really needs anything. And, and I always want to thank my team for allowing this to, to just come out this way.